Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special Rideshare Rodeo Live with uh, Harry Campbell, the Rideshare guy. Um, Harry, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's been a while since I've uh, personally joined your podcast. I know I, thought, I think a couple of my contributors have been on, and uh, yeah. I'm excited to be back. I uh, I appreciate that you're still going strong in the rideshare space and covering lots of companies and interesting topics. So always uh, am a fan of your podcasts and videos. So uh, keep up the good work. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's, uh, I just put out my 163rd episode. So nice. I mean, I think that, you know, just a quick background on Harry and I, I think we met on Twitter in 2017 when I was starting UberLiftDrivers.com. We right. communicated a little bit. I actually, when I, I don't know if it was 2016 or 2017, but when I met you, I actually got a paper copy of your book. I don't oh, know how nice. many people still do that, but I, I think, actually got uh... one in paper and I was like, I was already doing Uber, but I read through it nice. and I was like, you know, this is all right. Well, I don't I don't know the exact numbers, but I do think our book has sold like over 10,000 total copies. So uh, I think we have done a bunch of paper sales and maybe, you know, like 10 or 20 percent or Kindle sales. So, you know, definitely uh, not making a lot of money off the book, unfortunately, <laughs> because the publisher takes most of the money. But uh, there's definitely but a lot of people that, out but there. Was that, that ever book. the point anyway? No, no, I, I, I didn't really uh, write the book. Uh, to make money. It was just more uh, for me, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So right. I kind of like doing new things and like the challenge and I had never written a book before. And so putting, uh, you know, the book was a lot of fun. And, you know, the nice thing about a book too, is there's a lot of finality to it, right? When you're done, you're done uh, versus a blog or YouTube or podcast where it's just sort of never ending, right? Which is good and bad. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. That's, you know, that's often what I tell, and that's kind of, I think what we're going to get into mm -hmm. a little bit today is that I tell people that, who often like they'll, they'll come to me and they'll say, well, you know, well, you know, but Harry always is like this or Harry always does this or Harry always covers this. Mm -hmm. And yet when I put it all together, it's really like you've covered the whole space and even they're acknowledging it. I yeah. think the one thing that's often missed with you is that you're a business. You've created a business. There, there are people who count on you for their livings. For sure. I mean, yeah. they make no, their I mean, living. I, I think uh, everyone in the gig economy, whether they realize it or not, is I think I talk about this in my book is running a business. Right. So definitely, you know, I think I'm not shy about the fact that, you know, this is my business. This is how I, you know, make a living with my blog and podcast and YouTube channel. And I mean, we have four or five people now, uh, you know, that are basically we're paying full time. So not only do I need right. to make money for myself, but I need to make money to pay them. Right. Uh, so, I mean, that's sort of good and bad. Right. A lot of pressure. Sure, but also I think it's pretty cool to be able to provide, uh, you know, income that people can, uh, you know, actually rely on. Yeah. And that's, uh, and not to mention the other people who count on you for, even if it's only partial stuff, like you were talking about, like Sergio or Chris or yeah, some of the other contributors, like they're not full-time, but they count on their income coming yeah. through rideshare guy for things they do. So definitely. Yeah. No, Sergio is always asking me for raises. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't always say yes, but he's always asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sergio, Sergio promised me no matter how this went, they were going to tear me up on uh, on uh, Show Me the Money next week. So All right. that's why I thought, well, yeah, oh, perfect. It drops today and Show Me the Money was yesterday. That'll give you guys six days to cool down first. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but I love those guys. And I love the fact that, you know, like when I've had Sergio on or when Sergio's dropped in on us, you know, he always mentions the fact that, uh, well, do you know why Harry and I even work together is that we don't see eye to eye. You know, or maybe you guys do more now that time has gone by. But when you met, you know, yeah. it's like you would have an um, opinion. Actually, he saw it differently. Or... Yeah, no, I actually think that uh, Sergio and I see eye to eye on a lot of issues, but he's maybe more outspoken than I am, right? I think for me, you know, like I sort of like everyone, like I never tell people what they should or shouldn't do, right? Like if right. I don't philosophically agree with someone on everything that they're saying or doing, I probably wouldn't hire them in the first place. So I think the thing that stuck out to me about Sergio is that I understood like from day one, I remember when he was leaving comments on our blog, and he had really good insight into driving. And also at the same time, I remember he was one of the top earners and making a lot of money. And yet he was still very skeptical of Uber. And I think that he represents, you know, like every driver is very different, right? And so I think he represents an interesting section of the population of drivers, right? Like not every driver is like, you know, wow, this is the best company ever. There are some drivers who love driving for Uber, right? There are some who are very skeptical. There are some who are kind of very skeptical and don't make money. And there are also some who are, you know, kind of skeptical 
because they've been doing it for so long. But if they've been doing it for so long, they've kind of figured out the system, right? And so right. I think that's the thing that like I always tell Sergio to kind of keep in mind is like, hey, you know, you're doing well and you're making a lot of money with Uber. You're one of the top drivers, right? And I think like the whole crux of my business is not telling people that they should or shouldn't drive for Uber. Like I like to let the facts speak for themselves. Like, hey, here's what the average driver is making, but you should be in the top 10 or top 20% of drivers, right? And if you're not in the top 10 or top 20% and you're you're complaining or bitching about how much money you're making or not making, that's kind of a you problem, right? If you're doing everything yeah. that you can or everything that you should, and you're doing well, or sorry, you're in that top 10 or 20%, and you're still not making enough money, then I can kind of empathize with that, right? It's more the drivers who are like, hey, I went out and drove a Tuesday afternoon in the middle of nowhere, and I made four bucks an hour. I'm like, yeah, you idiot. Obviously, you shouldn't have been driving during those <laughs> times and places, right? right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You're running a business, whether you realize it or not, right? And not everyone is cut out to be a business owner, right? Like it's a challenging uh, job. And so I think that keeping that perspective and like, I've always taken the approach, hey, if you want to work in the gig economy, I'm going to help you do it better. I'm going to help you make more money. And I think that's kind of like the underlying thesis of the whole business. I'm never going to tell anyone, don't work for Uber, don't work for Lyft, don't drive for DoorDash. I'm saying, hey, if you want to do that, I'll help you make more money pretty simply. Exactly. And and that's kind of, I think, what every gig tuber or podcast or or people writing on this space is doing is there i mean well for the most part they're all trying uh, to, yeah i don't know that i agree with that there, I mean, there are some doing, <laughs> there are so, there are some leading you down well, bad rabbit holes and like really <clears throat> I mean, no. I wouldn't say it's bad rabbit holes. I mean, I think it's just philosophically, right? Like people have different opinions of companies right. and Uber is and rideshare is a complex industry. It's not like there are a lot of positives and negatives, right? Like it's a very controversial industry for a reason, right? So I totally understand someone who has the viewpoint, right? Like if you're out there working 40, 50 hours a week for Uber and you're getting paid like an independent contractor, it's like, man, that sucks. Like I kind of understand why you want to be an employee because you're like working like an employee, but without any of the benefits, right? So like, right. I don't personally want to be an employee, but I understand that perspective, right? And I think the other thing too, is that obviously, you know, especially on YouTube, right? Like the most negative, the most sort of uh, you know, not click, I mean, clickbait, yes, but like, you know, when we do videos, like, wow, I can't believe the Uber CEO said this, or, you know, like that stuff always does well. And so I think that it depends on the type of business and the audience that you're trying to cultivate. Like for me, I always come back to like, hey, I want to help people make more money. I want, you know, I don't want them not driving. Like if they don't want to drive, that's fine. But if right. they're gonna, you know, if they're gonna do this job, I'm gonna help them do it better. Right. So like we try to balance that in our content, right? Like every video we do isn't saying like, wow, you know, we just did a post on our um, YouTube community tab that was really popular. And it was like the 20 things that suck about driving for Uber. Like we know that type of content will do really well, but I'm not going to post that every day. I'm going to post that once in a while. Cause it's like, Hey, people can act more upon the, like, here, here's a new product. Here's a new feature. Here's how you can make more money. Here's how Sergio made, you know, X, Y, Z dollars last week. Right. Um, and then, you know, pepper in some content, like at the same time, like, yeah, it's annoying when you get a passenger who slams your car door or whatever, right? Like the annoying things that we all know about driving. Like, I think it's okay to sort of, um, you know, lament those things here and there, right? But like, I don't want that to be every post. And also from a business perspective, again, remember I'm running a business, right? If you're bashing on the companies and bashing on driving all the time, it's gonna be tough to turn that into a, you know, like thriving business. You have a partner come along and it's like, they help drivers make more money. And so now it's sort of like, hey, wait, you're talking shit about driving for Uber, but you're promoting a company that helps you make more money. Which one exactly. is it, right? Exactly. Um, I guess what I was getting at more was that there are maybe it's more than I used to notice because I wasn't on YouTube as much when I was just focused on podcast and the website mm -hmm. and Twitter and stuff. But there are some people on YouTube now who are charging fees, especially in the food space. I don't want to get into any name naming or channel dropping or anything, but there's more than one. Go for it. Let it rip, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more than one who are charging weekly, monthly fees, whatever to guarantee you they can hand select things for you better than you can yourself. That kind of stuff to me has gotten very weird. They've moved them over to discord servers and things mm. like that. Well, I mean, I don't, I mean, I guess I don't know the specific scenarios that you're referring to, but I mean, in general, like I don't have a problem with anyone charging for their time or their money. Right. Like I think there's this sort of, 
like I understand, right? Like obviously, if the our proof audience, is in the pudding, yeah. Well, I mean, I think our audience of you know gig drivers and workers in general, right? Like a lot of people in like you know they don't make a lot of money, right? Like drive gig work workers, like they're not bringing in a hundred thousand dollars a year for the most part, so they don't have a lot of disposable income. So I understand the sort of hesitation, right? Like people, you know, I get people complaining to me all the time, like, "Wow, you charge for your course, you charge for your book." I'm like, "Yeah, ninety nine percent of my content is free, and one percent my book or my course." Right. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to pay money for it. You can literally email me anytime for the past eight years and me or someone on my team will respond and hopefully answer your question, right? Like that's a free service. So like there's obviously this expectation, right, out in society that people want content for free. But I mean, it takes a lot of time and money and energy and resources to create this. So I have no problem with people trying to monetize. Um, and even if, you know, maybe it's something that I wouldn't do personally, like, I, don't, I guess I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think it's more on the user, more on the viewer to sort of decide like, hey, is this someone worth paying uh, money or time for, right? If it's like, you know, join a coaching group and, you know, with this YouTuber who's making, you know, $1,000 a week on DoorDash, and if that holds you accountable, and, you know, that coaching or whatever that weekly session like then helps you make more money. Like I would say that's a pretty good investment. I don't think that's a great business model because we've tried a lot of that stuff and it's hard to get drivers to pay for stuff like that. But um, I do think that, you know, if it works for yourself, right, like there's, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of options out there. Well, the, the second we are done here, I will email you one that has become like the name that we don't mention anymore. Okay. But it's still out there, and I'm gonna send it to you because I'm. What is the gist I'm, of it? They try to get their folks to join. It's just DoorDash. It's about mm -hmm. being top dasher. Yeah, and that if you are, they can make you so much more, and they can prove it. Yet mm -hmm. we've kind of dissected that the other way, and said it's actually about the large order program. It's not about the top dasher. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, really, you could make way more money as a large order program person, and that's what it really comes down to. But the charging is a lot. There's actually three groups out there, but there's one that's very well known that's charging $40 a week, $160 gotcha. a month. And to me, I have to do at least five times that. If I'm paying somebody 160 a month, this is just me personally. I want to make yeah. five times that much, five times the 160 I'm spending out if it's really making me more money. Got if it. I'm spending 160 and I'm making 250, I don't actually look at that as like, well, I made, you know, I made a few extra bucks. I look at that as that could have just been that week. Yeah. I mean, I would say it depends on each situation, but I mean, the nice thing is that the results are, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? Like if you're spending yeah. 40 bucks a week and you normally make a hundred or, you know, $500 a week, and now you're making seven fifty from something, it's like pretty obvious. So I guess like to me, you know, like stuff like that, if there's not real value being added, it's not going to last for very long, right? Like right. people yeah. are, you know, people aren't stupid, right? They'll figure it out eventually. And there's people giving the same advice that's being given on these discord groups uh mm -hmm. for free on youtube and to me yeah. that's a little weird because i feel like and you know this better than anybody people come and go through youtube like nobody's business somebody comes on and they find your stuff yeah. and they're still looking at basic 101 how do i start yeah. rideshare well, I mean, I think the challenge is that sometimes, I mean, it's like I can go to the gym and work out and get really buff if I go every single day, but yes. to do that and have the accountability is really tough, right? Like some days I wake up and I feel a little down or a little sick or don't want to go. If I have a personal trainer that I pay a hundred dollars per hour and it's like, I don't, I, I lose that hundred dollars if I don't show up, I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to show up every single yeah. day and I'm going to get ripped <laughs> and I'm going to get buff, right? So it's like the same kind of concept in that sometimes like, one of the reasons why I like having certain paid options like our course or our book or I mean, really the courses. So like the course is a good example. We've got a rideshare course um, that we've updated recently and also a delivery course. And I mean, one of the reasons why I like that, it's a lot of the same information that I have on the blog, on the YouTube channel. But the two things is one, it's very organized, right? So it's sort of like a crash course. So if you want to become a rideshare driver and you don't want to filter through like I literally if people email me, I'm like, yeah, all the information in my course you can go find for free on my website, on the YouTube channel. But if you go to the course, it's all there, like super neatly laid out. And then second, there's a lot of accountability. That's why I don't give my courses away for free, because I know right. if someone pays ninety nine dollars for my course, they're going to watch every damn video. right? Or at least they should. Right. right, right? right. So I think like that accountability is also important. So that's why I'm sort of like. 
like on the coaching stuff and anything that kind of like encourages you to work more or do more consistently or have some accountability, uh, you know, I think is beneficial. I think the, the trap that people sometimes fall into is that they like spend so much time in like coaching groups, they don't actually go out and do the work, right? Usually if you're like, it's like a catch 22, right? Like the people who need the co or you know who could benefit from like coaching and community and all that are like too busy out there doing shit and getting work done and the people yeah. are kind of like sitting there at home you know like dicking around like oh should i work today should i not they're the ones yeah. you know kind of like in the groups right so it's sort of like that catch 22. yeah i mean i i agree and i think that you know if if after you know the, also those people who go out there for a week give it even if they give it their all for a week or whatever they're like this isn't for me i i'm like you know, is that how you treat every job? That's how I always think of it. Do you always yeah. try every job for a week and say this doesn't work? Because yeah, you've well, got to give it some time. You Even sure. if you know your market, I don't care. Sure. This is going to take a minute. Yeah. And I mean, this is sort of like what I talk about a lot in my book. It's really like the first day, the first few days, the first week or two, even maybe the first month, it's less about how much money you're making and more about understanding the system, you know, how pay works, how to deal with passengers, or if you're delivering food, you know, what type of orders to look for, where to work, yes. when to work, what services to work for. And so I think that learning curve is important. And, there, you know, we've done a lot of analysis that really clearly shows like within the first six to 12 months, there's a pretty steep learning curve. And like after you get about a year, or I think the number, it was like a couple thousand, one or 2000 trips under your belt across all the platforms, your average earnings start to go up. So just with experience, you start to make more money, which kind of makes sense, right? Like, you know, when to work, where to work. And so what I try to do like with our course, with our book, with our content in general is accelerate that learning curve, right? Like we see the average driver, it takes them a thousand trips to get from, you know, let's say $15 an hour on rideshare to $20 an hour. Well, if you can learn all that, you know, experience from a thousand trips in the first month, you're now earning $5 more per hour for 11 months, right? So it's like a pretty good deal if you can figure that out. So I'm guessing that you keep <laughs> you keep these updated because as you and I know from back, even when we met on Twitter, like the ways to earn best or not the ways that they were to earn best in 2015 and 2016. Yeah. I mean, I would say it, they are and they aren't. So, I mean, I think the principles, uh, so that's one thing that I'm big on. It's like really teaching and explaining the principles, right? So I would call this like more evergreen content. So like we've done two rideshare courses now and our second version, we really focused on the principles, right? So we don't have a ton of detailed data on things like, you know, flat rate surge, right? Because that is changing and evolving so quickly. So if you create a course, it's like out of date in six to 12 months, right? So what we try to focus on is the principles, right? Like one of the biggest principles I've always said is don't chase the surge, right? And so we explain how surge works. And if you understand the system and that it's based on supply and demand, you can actually apply that to flat rate surge, right? Like we've done a bunch of videos lately where Uber is surge baiting, right? And, you know, drivers obviously hate this. They're pissed. You know, they'll be offline. They see that they're in an area where Uber is guaranteeing a $10 flat rate surge. They log on and it drops to $5. Now, I actually think yeah. this might have been more of a glitch, but that concept, right, is the same as in the old surge system, right? Where you would, we would always tell drivers, don't chase the surge, right? Because there's going to be other drivers driving to that area and as passengers make you know those requests get filled the surge goes down right so it's like if you understand that concept you apply it to new surge right and so now with the sticky surge if you see an area that's let's say 15 dollars right like it's the same thing, right? Like you understand you're taking a calculated yes. risk, right? If you drive to that area. And what's nice about the flat rate is that if you get into that area, it sticks, right? So your next trip will be, right? So there are actually times where it kind of makes sense, right? But you have to keep in mind the fact that like, hey, let's say there's 10 riders in that area that are requesting, but only five drivers that can service those rides. That's what causes a surge, right? Because there's five Which riders. Which will go away very quickly. Right. And so those five <laughs> match with the five. And then, hey, how many drivers? drivers are nearby and they're like, oh shit, let me drive to this area where it has a 10 or $15 flat rate surge. So you're racing against five or 10 or 20, who knows, right? You don't actually really know, but like you understand the principle, you're racing against those drivers. So if you're close by, it might make sense to do it. If you're further away, the odds of you getting there before those other drivers are lower, right? And so if you kind of understand that principle, you're not going to be like, wow, Uber's out there to screw me and they're out to get me. It's like, no, that's how surge works. <laughs> so if you right. understand exactly. that, you can kind of make a calculation calculated decision like oh in this situation it's worth it or in this one it isn't and specifically i think there was actually a glitch that i think uber has fixed so it was like dropping the second you would log online and that was like more of a glitch but still uh, in my opinion but um 
it seems like they might have fixed that or changed it or updated their algorithm. But, you know, that's still that same concept of surge applies. I think that's why and I've always agreed with you about don't chase the surge. In fact, I wrote an article about do not chase the surge, especially if you're not very close. Don't race over to like, yeah. especially like sporting events and things like that. Even those that could last for a little while, you're going to get stuck in traffic. You're going to lose time. Yeah. But one thing I, I will say is that maybe it was a little more worth it when it was a multiplier. Because you could actually watch, wait a minute, something's happening here. Yeah. It wasn't just, hey, get over here. It was yeah. more like, hey, there's something well, growing, growing, and, growing. You know, I mean, I think Sergio has done a really good job of sort of highlighting how he does it in his articles and videos where he basically, you know, if you understand the traffic patterns in Los Angeles, for example, in like Santa Monica, like surge yes. starts building at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. And then by nine, it peaks, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the same thing every Monday through Friday. You just sit there and watch the app and you sort of start understanding and that's like the type of experience that we talk about right like at sports games right you know that same kind of concept applies right there's like basically a demand peak right so you can kind of try you might not be able to time it perfectly but you sort of get the hang of like hey why don't i wait offline for five or ten minutes you know and right. then when it peaks i grab a ride right and it's just like that same concept uh True. you know i think applies in a lot of situations and that's sort of why i say that like this isn't like super easy to figure out it's not rocket science but it's somewhere in the middle and so that's why you know for the drivers who figure it out you see a lot of drivers who've been driving with uber three four five six seven years they got plenty of complaints and they don't like this and they've been screwed before totally get all that but they've also still doing it so they've obviously figured it out and made it work and then you also have a lot of new drivers i feel like it's kind of a barbell you don't have a ton in between right it's like a lot of newbies and a lot of veteran drivers because they figured out the system and you know everyone kind of in between or not that many people in between basically so. yeah um yeah I, I even sergio the last time he was on uh he had said something along the lines of you know like he did uh a week of delivery too and he didn't yeah. realize how much it screwed up his uber yeah because it really took him back to step one and he had to like kind of rebuild his whole thing yeah. <laughs> to be able to yeah. get it back on his bonuses. Yeah, no, I remember. I think he was uh, pretty pissed, but also that's yeah. sort of where it's like, hey, it's nice too if we're trying these things out and then other people can kind of understand, right? You imagine it from Uber's perspective, right? Like not a lot of people actually switch from rideshare to food delivery, right? So if they sort of identify that you start doing a lot of food delivery, they're probably going to say like, hey, this guy likes food delivery. Why don't we give him bonuses that are more tailored to food delivery and so i think sergio was pissed but i think from the company's perspective it kind of made a lot of sense even though he may not have uh loved it man we're talking a lot of sergio today. yeah he's really this is a good ego he's gonna he's now. gonna love it <laughs> but this is what i really wanted to get into was sure. so often i see comments about your interviews with the giants you know with lyft and uber you know you've interviewed uh dara what three times now yep and on the third one, this is me personally. I think you did a much like that was my favorite interview that you had done with him. Oh, and thank you. wouldn't that make sense, people? I mean, that you know, you do one, yeah, you do two. <laughs> By the third, you're feeling a lot because I'm yeah. sure that you feel. I mean, I'm not going to say uncomfortable, but that's a big situation to be in. And yeah, I'm sure there's parameters. I don't know what of that you could explain or let people know sure. because I see all these comments like, well, <laughs> higher pay, safety. This, I yeah. mean, the the basics. And of course, we all want that. I'm not saying that. But it's not like you can just come into that interview, first of all, an interview one with, with Dara and say, hey, they need higher pay. They need safety. It's just too, he'd be like, what? Or his yeah. team, or I'm not really, I'm not even sure of the full. Sure how it works. Yeah, no, but... I'm happy to give uh, the behind the scenes. But I mean, yeah, basically, I've interviewed Dara, for example, three times. Usually, you know, they throw, excuse me, they throw me a bone every couple of years. You know, he's been at the company for quite a while. So it's not like right. I'm interviewing him all the time. It's literally like about right, every right, two right. years where I interview him. And, you know, I mean, I think in general, right, like, I think that Uber doesn't love everything we say about the company, but I think they also understand that, you know, we're pretty fair. We don't have, you know, like everything that they do isn't, you know, we don't say as negative, like some are, you know, I think probably more positive than negative. So I think that in that type of forum, you know, I think that they do respect that, right? Like I, you know, if I'm running Uber, I probably wouldn't want to go on some YouTubers channel. Who's like, wow, everything Uber does is like, sucks fucking sucks like why would i send my ceo <laughs> to do that type of interview like my job at uber is to make the company look as good as possible whether you agree with that or not right but at the same time you know i think uber and lots of companies realize like when they message drivers it's like no one really believes it right because it's like uber right it's like right. they say oh this is a new feature this is great 
but you're like, dude, this is Uber. Like, obviously they're going to say it's great. So I think like finding that middle ground, you know, like an outlet like ours, right. Where it's like, Hey, I, they know I'm going to ask them about the things that drivers care about, but I'm not going to be like, you know, why are Uber drivers slaves to the company? Like that wouldn't, I don't personally feel that. And I'm not on there to like attack him for his business practices. I really, you know, want exactly. them to sort of share his point of view and, you know, share what they're working on with drivers, like in that context. Right. So I think that's kind of like how I go into it. And yeah, definitely. It's great for me. Like obviously makes me look good personally in the business. You know, if we can interview Uber, CEO. And so I think it is kind of like a fine line to walk. And it's kind of like a good challenge, right? Like, I actually often joke that like, if everybody is a little pissed at me, I'm probably doing a good job, right? If like, we have comments in there, like, Harry, you're a sellout. Wow, how much did Uber pay you for this interview? And if we've got Uber occasionally messaging me like, wow, what did why did Sergio say this about this article or this feature? It's like, okay, you know, everyone's a little pissed at us, we're probably doing a good job, right? If one side starts saying like, wow, this is the best interview I've ever, you know, it's like a little too one sided. So I think kind of walking that fine line is a fun, yeah. like from a entrepreneur and business standpoint, like that's like a fine line to walk. And I kind of like having to walk that tightrope and figure it out. Right. Because I do want to keep interviewing the executives, but at the same time, I want to ask them questions that our audience wants to know. So that's sort of like the high level. And then in these interviews, fortunately, to be honest, like Uber has never come to me and said, like, you can't ask them about this topic or driver pay or anything like that. In my most recent interview, the only thing I couldn't ask them was uh, about like financial earnings and statements and things like that, since they were about to release quarterly earnings, which is like a pretty standard practice for like public companies. And, you know, sure. I wasn't going to ask them like about their PL. Like, I don't even really understand that. Shit I was, anyway. was going to so say, like, like, I don't you know. think, yeah, that's probably right. just so more like, to make it, sure it really you know, wasn't, but... yeah, it really wasn't a big deal for me. Um, and, you know, so that's why I say fortunately, because, you know, like at this point, I've interviewed him three times if they came to me for a fourth interview in six or 12 months and said like hey you could interview them but all these you know this topic or that topic is off limits i think i'd probably say no but if it was my first interview it might be a lot tougher right because this is something that's good for me right like any youtuber any business owner if they're like they could interview the ceo of uber would probably jump at that chance right and so that's why it's like you kind of have to balance and that's why I said, fortunately, you know, Uber has never, you know, made that request of me because like if it would have been my first interview with Dara and they were like, you can't ask him about why Uber doesn't pay drivers enough. I would have been like, damn, that's like the one thing drivers want to know. <laughs> um, and so it's like, ooh, that's tricky. Like, I feel like I probably would have still done it and, you know, would have had to, you know, take the take the heat for not asking that or not selling it out. But I mean, now, you know, fortunately, that never happened. So I think that kind of addresses the first uh, two points that you sort of mentioned. Mentioned, right well and I've, I've pointed out to people that when you you know if you did come in and ask that question these guys are professionally trained a hundred times over on how to get yeah. around the question so that's a that's a good point point. and so i will say that like the first time i inter interviewed dara it was at a driver event in los angeles and it actually wasn't televised uh publicly and so there was like a few hundred drivers in the audience and it was me and him on stage for 20 minutes and we took questions after and you know i was definitely nervous that time it was also in person it was the first time i've ever met him and probably the biggest interview i had ever done and you know i think i did an okay job but i think the two things i learned from that interview that i've sort of applied i thought i thought i did a pretty good job in my second interview with him. And I do agree in the third interview, I think was my best yet because, you know, I had that experience. And also, you know, I wasn't as intimidated, like the first time, definitely a bit exactly. intimidated. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that's, you know, I, I think it's easy to say you wouldn't be, but like when you're up there, you're like, oh man, I don't want to fuck this up. Yep. <laughs> and, exactly. you know, the, uh, you know, but as you get more comfortable, like I've now met him three times, right? Because I've interviewed him three, or, you know, at least chatted with him three times. So I think there's that aspect, right? That you sort of start to get less intimidated, become more comfortable. And then the two things that I learned is one, these guys are trained professionals, like you said, right? Like they are CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies for a reason, right? Like they know how to answer questions and they know how to sometimes evade questions. So the two things I learned was one, you always kind of want to have a good follow-up. You want to think about what their response might be and how you could follow up to that. It's like, hey, you know, why does Uber pay, you know, why do, you know, Drivers say that, uh, you know, low pay is like their number one complaint complaint. And I know that Dara would say, obviously, he doesn't think they pay too low. Right. So he's going to say something around like, well, you know, we think that this is what the market is priced at. And then, you know, like you want to think about a follow up question for that. Right. So that's sort of the first thing that I learned. And I think I've applied, you know, in more interviews, you know, with him and others going forward. And then I think 
The second thing is also just like not asking questions that you're going to get a bad answer to, right? Like if you go out and ask Dara, like kind of some question along those lines, like, hey, why does Uber pay its drivers so shitty? That's kind of a stupid question to ask because yeah. you know he doesn't feel that way. Like he's not going to be like, yeah, totally agree with you, Harry. It's in <laughs> the gonna, wording, yeah. Yeah, he's going to be like, no, we pay just fine, right? So you kind of yeah. want to tailor the question more to that, right? And remember too, I only have 20 or 30 minutes with this guy and usually I'm like pushing it, right? And there's like three hours of questions that I want to hit on. And, you know, like I also want the interview to feel natural, right? I don't want to just ask a list of questions, right? I want the conversation right. to flow naturally, right? So right. those are sort of the things I'm balancing. I'm not make, trying to make this seem like the toughest thing to do in the world, but that's sort of why I like doing it because it is challenging. It is tough, um, you know, and like I think with each interview, hopefully I'm getting better and uh, better. So the, I mean, I guess I have to, I have to hit on this because I think that with the recent John Zimmer, um, Lyft's president, uh, I believe that you hit on quite a good few things because I, I know that you talked about having real names, real yep. pictures. Uh, you talked about transparency, transparency, transparency. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so let's the credit, they fare, are you know, releasing it's... like five or ten different like new products and features. Some are you know copying Uber with the upfront fares for drivers, but you know they are launching like long pickup. And so I mean, I think it is important to like that's for me like. I think it is important to give the companies credit when they are doing things, right? Like, hey, Lyft hasn't done much over the past couple of years. Now they're doing stuff. So like, let's highlight it. Like, I'm not saying you have to agree that this is the best thing since sliced bread, but I do think like, that's sort of the, the viewpoint that I try to provide. Like, hey, I want to give the companies credit if or when they do do something positive for drivers. And then when they don't, we'll call them out on it. And I think that balance, right? Like if you're always saying like, wow, everything Lyft or Uber launches is shit. This sucks, that sucks. How do you know? It's like the boy who cried wolf. Well, like you always say everything sucks. Like, how do I know? Right. So that's why I kind of like having that balance because then when Uber and Lyft do do something that's really bad it, and we cover it and we talk about it, it really stands out because it's like, hey, we talk sure. about the new features that we like and this and that. And then it's like if they do something we don't like, it like stands out. Right. Versus if everything you think that they do is negative. Yeah. So I, I got to ask you this then, because sure. since the beginning, I mean, I, I know we're a little, we're running a little short on time here, but I got to get this out. So since the beginning, I've wanted transparency, transparency, transparency. I hear you talk about it all the time. Yeah. It looks like now, at least I, I know that they're both going to these models, but I did hear something when you were talking to John, where he said, I, I remember you asked him something. I don't remember the exact words along the lines mm -hmm. of, you know, why hasn't this been available sooner? this yep. transparency that we're talking about. And I really, his, I, I appreciated his answer, even though I didn't like it, which was it should have started much sooner. Yeah. I appreciated I mean, I that. With, yeah. Um, I mean, I think with a lot of these features that Uber and Lyft, I think we even joked when Uber announced our upfront fares, I think we even joked in our article, like what took so damn long, right? I mean, you and I have been doing it for a while. I, sure, I first started driving for Uber and Lyft in 2014. And when I first started driving, I'm like, this is crazy. You don't know where the passenger is going. You don't know how much money you're making, right? So, I mean, this has definitely been an issue for a while. And I mean, I think bluntly, I don't think the companies, you know, would really say this, but like it wasn't a priority, right? Like they didn't have to do it, right? Like they were able to get enough drivers signing up and taking rides like so they didn't have to right now they're struggling to recruit and retain drivers and so it's like well let's give them more so like that's the blunt reason in my opinion why it's taken so long yeah i mean when i started too it was a it was a percentage split and i didn't even get to see the pers the actual breakdown though i just yeah. made enough money where i was like that's cool i don't care yeah. like <laughs> so but I guess what I want to know now is after all these years of fighting for transparency, this, uh, I guess this is the, the big question here is, mm -hmm. do you think that the transparency models that are coming out are going to make people happy? Or do you think there's been some algorithmic gain between Uber and Lyft that now they've got it down to a point where, yeah, if we'd have done this five years ago, maybe it would have helped you guys more than you think? You know, I think it definitely is an incremental benefit. I mean, I think it makes the experience as a driver 
better. I don't think it's like two times better. Maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 20%, you know, so I would call it an incremental improvement. Like it's nice, you know, now it's like, Hey, I can see where I'm going. Like a lot of drivers prefer short trips or some prefer long trips or some like want to stay out of certain areas of town, you know, because they're not familiar, right? Like we know like how important navigation is to passengers. Right. And so if you know the West side of Los Angeles really well, and you don't know the East side that well, um, you know, maybe I want to stay in the West side. Right. So it's like, there's a lot of preferences that drivers have. And so I think like for Uber it's and Lyft, it's kind of a win-win if you kind of like give drivers, if they can like make the same amount of money, but stay in the area that they want to drive, that's like kind of a win-win. Like obviously drivers would prefer to make more money. That's why I said it's not like a 2X improvement, but you know, it's like a little bit better. It's a little, you know, and when you multiply that times two or 3 million drivers, that 10% improvement does add up to a lot for Uber, maybe less so for individual drivers. And I think that's kind of always the inherent tension between drivers and the companies, right? Uber and Lyft care about their bottom line. Like they care, number one, about themselves, right? right? Drivers need to care about themselves, right? So it's like, what Uber and Lyft do isn't always necessarily what's best for you as a driver. As an individual driver, I want as few drivers on the road as possible. So I'm getting lots of requests. There's lots of surge pricing. But think about that over the long term, right? If I, there's all, if there's never enough drivers, it's not as reliable for the customers, right? And then they're not going to take as many Ubers. And then you're not going to get as many trips. And I'm not saying that individual drivers need to worry about that, right? But that's what Uber is thinking about, right? Because you can imagine in that situation, right? Like, I don't think it's driver's responsibility to worry about that. But if that was happening, you would get less trips and make more, less money over time, right? There's like, that's pretty simple math. So I think that that's like the type of stuff Uber and Lyft are worried about. And so you think about like, okay, that's what they care about. What I care about is kind of the opposite. And then sort of finding that those opportunities, you know, where you can kind of benefit yourself and make the most amount of money. Because that's one thing that I try to highlight over and over. You know, there's this big study that I ranted on and did a video on the other day that said, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers are making $6.20 per hour. I saw, I saw the in, article too. In California. And like what I'm saying is like, okay, their gross was 26 an hour. Uber right. says the average during that time was 30 an hour, which I kind of agree with. Sergio during that same time period, this was November, 2021, was making 50 to $60 an hour. So right. like, yeah, maybe some drivers are not making that much money. We can argue over whether it's six bucks or 10 bucks or 15 bucks after expenses, but like, forget all that. Like you should be one of the top drivers anyways, right? Like right. Th this isn't rocket science out there. Like you could just watch our YouTube channel and gain the knowledge or, you know, Steve, your channel or the interviews you do and use these apps, use these services. Like if you want to make money, you can, right. Is sort of more yeah. my point. And it may still not be enough or, you know, maybe you want to make more, but like, I think that like, I kind of take anyone that's complaining, but not in that upper 10 or 20%. I sort of take their complaints with a grain of salt. Yeah. I also take in their G where they're located, what their yeah. cost of living is. I mean, for sure. My cost of, I know that yours is through the roof. You're in Los <laughs> Angeles. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's probably the most ridiculous in the country up there with New York <laughs> City. Yeah. But Denver's not that far off from you guys now. I'm yeah. pretty sure you're sure. somewhat in touch with that. It's got very expensive to live anywhere here. Yeah. And yet you could go live in rural Sterling, Colorado and have a six bedroom house for half the price of what I pay for 900 square feet. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, your cost of living is a is a big deal too. If you're only make if you're making five dollars less an hour than me, you're doing much better than me. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's like you can't break it down to that actual amount. But I guess what I was getting at is I love the transparency. I love the fact of seeing everything. I want to see where I'm going, where I'm picking up. This is the stuff I've wanted forever. So even if they have figured out a little ab algorithmic gain to their advantage. I still wonder if, and I trust me, I'm not one of those people who believes they can cut my pay any lower before I go, hey, I got <laughs> other apps too that I could use. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, if I'm losing a few cents here or there, but I'm getting all the information, I think to me, that actually becomes worth it. I'll probably catch a ton of heat for this, but to me, that's worth it. I'll take a little bit of a loss to see everything because sometimes I know better routes. I know better how we're where they're putting me how yeah. i'll do from there at that time um so all that really matters and i guess in the big picture if it was just a yes or no do you think that the transparency model that they're both talking about being everywhere i know it's in certain markets now but being everywhere by the end of the year do you think that this is going to be a good thing because i'm hearing mixed things across mm -hmm. the board on this or do you think it's going to be 
not what people have wanted for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I think it will be a good thing. I mean, there's going to be a bit of a learning curve, right? I mean, the system, the pay is going to be slightly different. But I mean, let's be honest, like the companies I don't think are going to are switching to the system to pay drivers more. They're doing it to pay them the same or maybe even less, um, but give you more flexibility, right? So I think if the pay is the same and there's more flexibility, that's pretty obviously uh, a good thing. So, I mean, I think that like if pay ends up going down over time, it's like not because of the system. It's more because the companies want to try and make money or you know other factors and so i think that like that kind of ties into again right like hey lyft and uber want a ton of drivers on the road you kind of want the opposite right so it's like you're still relying on them for certain things right like you like think about the things you can control and you can't right and so that's sort of what i would worry about yeah that's i agree with that so i guess uh Last thing I would ask Harry is like, if you were getting into the gig, you, if you had to mm-hmm. just work one gig yeah. these days and you don't even have to say which one it would be, but would it <laughs> be rideshare, yeah. food delivery, last mile yeah. services? Where would you go? Definitely, I'd probably start uh, with rideshare, Uber specifically, even if I had to pick one. I mean, I've always felt that rideshare uh, pays the most, and that's yeah. kind of what I care most about. And so I think that, you know, people will always pay more for a ride for themselves than they will for a burrito. I think it's hard to argue with that. And I think that, you know, in general, you can make the most uh, driving people around and doing Uber specifically since they're the busier app. So if I had to pick one, that's what I would go with. But at the same time, you know, I'm always open into new opportunities and new companies and you know understand that uh you know i'm working for myself not uber so you know if something yes. better comes along i i don't i don't have uh to to any problems switching over yeah and thank you for saying that because honestly that's something that i hit on all the time is that independent contractors need to understand that they are that even if they're yeah. the even if they're going to become the new hybrid model of it because yeah. i was doing independent contractorship 10 years before apps existed to do yeah. so i've been doing it from the traditional standard and looking at it from the app standard it might turn into some high hybrid kind of model but you still need to understand it you need to understand for, sure. it for tax purposes how much you're really earning what this really means because i think most people just think i see equals flex mm-hmm. and that's yeah. it, it's a lot more than that for sure cool well appreciate it steve hey harry thank you for your time sorry i kept you over but uh, no it's hard. Not, it's hard not to. Every time we, no we get together, I, I, I can keep time. Harry. It's it's like Harry was saying with Dara. I could keep Harry on for hours and <laughs> bug him until he was like, "I gotta go." <laughs> Good conversation. I, I appreciate you having me on. And yeah, people want to hear more of my unfiltered thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm on. T- I'm pretty active on Twitter at the Rideshare Guy, and then also, you know, I still do my weekly podcast. Uh, so you could find that in iTunes. Just search for the Rideshare Guy, or we also transcribe them or post them on our YouTube channel. So usually that comes out every Friday. And then obviously my team is out there doing lots of great content. Chris and Sergio are doing the Tuesday uh, live show, Show Me the Money Club at 3 p.m. Pacific. And I think yesterday I saw we had like over a couple hundred people, over 200 people watching live. And, you know, that's getting a, a lot of it uh, traction. Is. So definitely lots of ways to just yeah. basically type, uh, you know, any 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 box on the internet, you should be able to find us. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put Harry's links in there too. But when he says the podcast, you guys, you don't just need to go to one anyway. You can go to any podcatcher yep. and find Rideshare cool. Guy. It's on everyone. So, Harry, thank you for your time. Um, I really do appreciate when you stop by. And uh, I hope some some people learn from this stuff that, you know, there's business, there's business, and there's how we work. And everybody, be safe out there, earn smart, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Steve. Peace, everybody.